Well, hello and welcome everyone to the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce and Jersey Finance's live fireside chat on Jersey Finance's fascinating new report on the global attitudes to Islamic wealth management. I'm Julia Charlton, Chairman of the Commonwealth Chamber, and I'm very excited to be joined by Jersey Finance's Director for the Middle East, Africa and India and Senior Lead on Islamic Finance, Faisal Bana. Jersey Finance is a not-for-profit organization which is one of the world's leading international financial centers. It has various offices around the world in financial hubs, including Hong Kong, where I am, New York, Dubai, and Shanghai. And Jersey Finance also works closely with key global partners to offer legislative services to nurture an ethical, reputable, and secure investment environment for clients. So the topic of discussion for today is Jersey Finance's recent report, The Global Attitudes to Islamic Wealth Management, which I find an enlightening and unprecedented piece of research, which sheds light on the specifics of the Sharia legal framework for wealth management, and also includes a survey of the views and attitudes of Muslim high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals and family officers towards key elements of wealth management, mainly succession planning, fiduciary planning, inheritance tax, current and future demands for investment products, ethical alignments, and the distinctions between different jurisdictions. The survey also sheds light on the future of the Sharia finance market and what trends and strategies we can predict the Islamic wealth managers and their clients will be working towards. So as I mentioned here to present these fascinating findings for us today is Faisal Barna, who leads Jersey Finance's strategy development and engagement across Africa, India, and the Middle East with a special focus on key markets, liaising and working with key stakeholders, including public and private institutions, corporates and families, and building long-term mutually beneficial relationships. Faisal has an impressive academic background in law, and he's been a valuable mentor for HRH Prince Charles's charities and the Princess Trust and Mosaic. And he continues with his passion for mentoring young, dynamic and promising entrepreneurs globally. Faisal currently mentors MBA students from um, Oxford Business School, Saeed, where I was also briefly a student. So I'm very pleased and honored to have you here, Faisal. Thank you very much. I know you've just arrived in London and it's great of you to get on this call. And I'm very excited for our audience to hear about the findings of the report. And I'm looking forward to our further discussion after that on the themes and trends. So just a word of housekeeping before we start. The fireside chat will be about an hour long. It will begin with the short presentation from Faisal and then we'll have a Q&A session between me and Faisal, a discussion about the whole report. And there will also be a Q&A chat box, which will be open for participants at any time to ask questions, which we hope that Faisal will be able to get to after the chat, which I have with him. So now then, Faisal, over to you. Thank you very much and a very good morning to everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you joined us from. Uh, thank you to the Commonwealth Chamber. Thank you, Julia. Uh, for that kind introduction and also uh, providing Jersey Finance the opportunity to talk about, like you said, groundbreaking research. I'm just going to put my presentation on so that um, we can just quickly go through that. I th uh, you know, we thought it would be useful to uh, to uh, provide some context. Uh, there will be a number of you on the call today wondering why Jersey um, uh, is leading on this conversation in this particular specialist niche area, and uh, therefore it'd be useful to uh, provide some context and background of why we got involved. And as uh, you mentioned, Julia, I'll also go through some of the key findings of the report, um, and then delighted to have a, con a further conversation about some of those findings and exploring those uh, a bit more. I, I you know, I, I should also mention. Um, that we will uh, you know, uh, um, be sending out a link to the report uh, that we're discussing this morning to all that have registered. And also your, uh, your team uh, at the Commonwealth Chamber have um, written a, a fantastic summary, I think, uh, of the report itself, which we can also share with all those that are registered, which um, uh, would provide a bit more context around some of the questions 
and some of the uh, findings also. Um, so uh, plenty to read after the presentation today. So just to go through uh, very quickly, um, uh, in, you, you, you gave a fantastic uh, opening and summary of our jurisdiction. Uh, so thank you very much for that. We are a leading uh, finance center globally, uh, independently recognized as such. But just to take a step back for those of you, of the listeners that don't actually know where Jersey, you know, uh, some basic information of Jersey. So I thought this would be useful to just sort of provide um, very high level stats about our jurisdiction. So we are an island nestled between France and the UK within the Channel Islands, close to France and the UK. We're a self-governing crown dependency of Great Britain. What that means is the Queen is the head of state for us, but we have an independent legislature and judiciary. And this becomes quite important in a moment when I try explaining the Sharia compliance uh, structure and expertise on Ireland. Uh, we're a very small population, you can see, uh, just under 110,000 uh, there. Um, and again, uh, from a substance perspective, it becomes important. I'll touch on that in a moment. We're not part of the United Kingdom or the European Union, so that uh, our jurisdiction, our IFC, provides a, uh, a globally um, uh, recognized and uh, um, award-winning platform for investors that are looking to do international investors across the globe, but particularly within these two key markets. Uh, as I mentioned, we're responsible for our own laws and taxes, and this is quite a significant point from a Sharia-compliant structuring perspective. You can see there's a lot on this slide. I don't intend to go through all of that, but just I'm going to pick up a couple of points from that slide if I can. Um, the expertise of our jurisdiction. So we're, we, were, we celebrated 60 years as an IFC last year, uh, and we have uh, about that much uh, decades-long experience and expertise of uh, advising on Sharia-compliant structures, products, and services from across the globe. We have stakeholders, including um, from the Far East, Middle East, Africa, that have been using our jurisdiction, not only for their uh, conventional products and structures and international investments, but also Sharia compliant. Um, in terms of a substance, I'll touch on this again. Uh, you know, we're an island of 107 to 10,000, um, roughly, depending on what time of the year it is, but we have around 14,000 people that work in the financial services sector. So almost 15% of our population is engaged in the sector. So that provides uh, you know, substance on the ground, expertise on the ground with decades of um, the required uh, experience um, and a required expertise for areas such as Sharia compliant financing. And this has um, certainly helped from a private wealth perspective, uh, uh, investors may come in for, uh, use our jurisdiction for one particular reason, but then once they interact with the industry, um, as you know, Julia, from uh, jurisdictions such as Hong Kong and other financial centers globally, um, once uh, you know, stakeholders start using the jurisdictions, then you know, have, that relationship grows and the confidence grows. So that was the other one. And then reputation, I think in this uh, age of transparency, reputation is a huge, huge factor for users of finance centers. Um, you know, we know MoneyVal and the uh, FATF uh, uh, assessments that are done globally have an impact on, uh, you know, on the jurisdictions that are reviewed and every jurisdiction on the planet is now being assessed in some way or the other uh, to ensure that they meet global standards, whether it's in, to, in relation to uh, money laundering, whether it's in relation to uh, confidentiality, et cetera. And Jersey has always topped these tables uh, and we've been a forward-thinking, early adopter of these global standards. So very proud of this. And again, this becomes uh, relevant from a Sharia-compliant perspective because some of the structures, as you know, especially financial products, are quite complicated. So working through a jurisdiction not only that has the expertise and experience, but has a global reputation, helps um, steer some of these uh, and provide confidence to international investors that are coming in and uh, and, and supporting and investing in these products. Uh, very quickly through this, these are the foundations of our industry, um, the four key pillars there, funds, private wealth, banking, and capital markets, but all underpinned by, uh, you know, by uh, the regulation, the rule of law, uh, political independence, economic stability, and tax neutrality. I'll just 
just briefly go through the, uh, ru- the rule of law and the regulation point. I think this is an important point to consider, and it's an important consideration for users of our jurisdiction when it comes to niche uh, areas such as Sharia compliant financing or even sustainable finance. Our ability to uh, devise and produce our own legal system, robust legal system, provides that additional comfort and expertise that stakeholders look for. So our trust law is developed over decades and you know, has been administered, used and protected over decades. The regulatory fra- framework around that also um, is something that is uh, an attraction for users of our jurisdiction. Um, we have, uh, um, uh, as you know, Julia, firewall legislation. So from a private wealth perspective, this firewall legislation gives comfort to users of our jurisdiction um, in the event that there's any challenge, this challenge has to be through the legal system and the courts within Jersey, uh, which is an important uh, point for founders and family businesses who use our jurisdiction to have that comfort that in the event, for example, of the death of um, you know, the founder of a trust, for example, then at least their wishes will be protected within the confines of our own judiciary and uh, legal system. So in addition to the four pillars that we have for our industry, we also have specialist supporting sectors. I've I've highlighted some there, and Islamic finance is one of those. Um, As I said, we celebrated 60 years last year, and we've been doing Sharia-compliant financing, structuring for as long as that um, from across the globe. So this is one area that we're proud of. Now, from a Sharia-compliant perspective, these are some of the key highlights and, and key characteristics that stakeholders have said to us um, and that, that sort of gives them comfort of using our jurisdiction. So familiarity, um, as I mentioned, we've been dealing with stakeholders from across the globe uh, on their Sharia wealth, uh, Sharia corporate needs, um, expertise, experience. Uh, so, um, and then obviously Jersey trusts and foundations, we're going to go into that in a, in a moment when we start talking the, about the report. But that's another quite an important consideration for stakeholders, Muslim clients, um, and users of the jurisdiction who have uh, this particular requirement to adhere to um, the Islamic faith. They they find these tools and these solutions and structures that are available in Jersey an important factor when they're choosing their own estate. Regulations, we've talked about this, this true parity under the Jersey law. So whether it's a Sharia compliant product or a conventional product, uh, the treatment under the law is equal. Uh, And this is an important factor uh, that uh, stakeholders of our jurisdiction find um, or or, or use as a consideration. A stable, reputable jurisdiction with a strong legal framework. This is a a summary that has been uh, repeated to us by different users of the industry, and I think it nicely summarizes um, our unique offering. Now, just uh, in terms of some of the trends that we're seeing in the market, particularly in the private wealth uh, sector, before we get into the research, and some of these will resonate with listeners uh, on uh, on, uh, the call today. Um, You know, the pandemic has accelerated some of the discussions around succession, whether it's being uh, as a result of death um, in the family of the patriarch or the matriarch or of that generation or whether it's about integration of the next gen. You know, it's quite, uh, it, it's quite telling because we were all grounded because uh, due to the re- travel restrictions, a lot of the next generation who would ordinarily have been uh, jet-setting across the globe were forced to be in one place and they had to focus their mind and thoughts on the family business or the family. And this resulted in a lot of these sec- discussions around succession, governance, etc., in fact, we now see uh, from research conducted by the big four um, on their annual surveys that they do of family businesses and family offices that next generation are now very much involved in the business. Some surveys have found 60% plus of next generation being involved in that. So they, these kind of accelerated discussions around succession and uh, around gov- family governance Um, also brought in uh, considerations um, about Sharia uh, because, uh, you know, some of the Muslim families, high net worth Muslim families in in particular, started looking at this question around, particularly when you're looking at uh, succession, 
they started looking at how do you build the requirements of the faith into succession uh, you know, from a family perspective. So th- th- this is one trend. The other quite important trend that we see in, uh, in, in global markets is the alignment or the perceived alignment between some of the principles of Sharia-compliant finance and uh, ESG-minded uh, investment uh, uh, dis- decision-making. Um, there's a number of areas within that um, that um, sort of uh, uh, work with investors on both sides. So whether it's ethical investing, whether it's socially responsible investing, and again, next generation play a key part here. You know, the next generation are very mindful of their impact. You know, how is my wealth impacting not only my community immediately around me, but the globe? And these conversations, we see it across the globe. You know, the people have become celebrities at the back of the, these conversations. And this alignment with Sharia compliant financing, uh, certainly around uh, provisions of governance and supervision and uh, particular investment strategies, this, this has worked and resonated with the uh, younger generation, the next generation. It's brought this conversation into the mainstream. So Sharia compliant financing was about um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, when it initially came about, it was always about banking and and trying to bring the unbanked uh, Muslim population or faith-based believers into the financial system. However, with the uh, with this perceived alignment between ESG and ethical financing, it takes that entire conversation into the mainstream. So you now have um, decisions, investment decisions being made. Uh, into Sharia-compliant products, not because of faith-driven reasons, but because of its alignment with some of these principles. Um, uh, The other interesting factor is the demand for uh, international finance centers, which which offer this experience and expertise in both these structures. Uh, So certain concentrations, certainly from the Middle East, Africa, uh, and also uh, um, uh, jurisdictions like Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, Brunei, you see that there is um, even the sovereign wealth funds in those areas are now looking at having a sustainable framework, but they have these requirements and, and asset allocations for Sharia compliant products. So this conversation um, you know, is, is br- very much bringing uh, this niche area into the mainstream. And there's a number of drivers for that. Now let's get into uh, the research itself. Um, and quickly go through that. Uh, We're still okay on time there, uh, but I'll I'll very quickly just go through some of the the key. So so what's the landscape? What's the context of this research specifically within the private wealth sector? So one thing that we have seen or we continue to see is the sophisticated Sharia-compliant financial instrument. So, you know, the likes of Sukuk. Everybody um, hopefully would have come across uh, the Sukuk, which is the equivalent of the uh, Sharia compliant bond. Um, you know, products like this, financial instruments, have taken over the limelight of the Sharia sector. And um, the private wealth sector has taken a, a sort of a, a back seat and, and, and has, has suffered as a result. Um, even though this was the area that was initially uh, where the demand for the uh, services were, you know, private individuals, consumers, that wanted to uh, uh, use their money and investments in a Sharia-compliant way um, have been overtaken by the larger, more complex uh, complex product. As a result, there's been an innovation slowdown, particularly in the consumer space, because people have focused on the more larger, especially institutional investors have overtaken that discussion. Um, there's a high demand, but restricted products and services as a result. Um, and this is good for the private wealth industry because it shows that there is potential in that industry. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen somewhat of a resurgence on the supply side. So, you know, you have, because of increased use of technology, uh, because of new fintech businesses coming online, uh, because of uh, these discussions and the trends that I talked about earlier, for example, around succession, there has been this resurgence on the supply side where now you know, using different technology, uh, the industry is trying to widen that scope of um, products and services that are available for this particular niche. Um, we've already talked about the ESG and the next generation that relies on technology. This is quite 
an important point. As the next generation gets involved in decision making uh, from a private wealth perspective, their reliance and their their, their habits, um, particularly around technology, play an important part in the development of these services and products that are going to be available in this industry. And we see that uh, in some of the uh, findings from our own research that we'll get into. So in, against this backdrop, uh, Jersey Finance commissioned uh, Gateway Global to undertake primary research with the aim of producing a report, uh, a blueprint, if you like, that could delve deeper into the trends shaping Sharia-compliant wealth management. Uh, through our research uh, report, Global Attitudes to Islamic Wealth Management, we wanted to get a better understanding of attitudes from the perspective of Sharia-minded family offices, high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals, and uh, private bankers towards Sharia-compliant and ethical wealth management services. And we wanted to get into the detail of this, you know, so that you know, there was there there was figures that people could rely on. So, you know, we asked some fundamental questions. You know, what values are held by Sharia compliant private wealth market? What are their attitudes to succession, to risk, to industry sectors, to ethical investment, to philanthropy? Um, and uh, you know, what where should product providers and international finance centers focus their attention? So in compiling this report, Gateway interviewed a cross-section uh, of some 2,000 high net worth individuals, family offices, institutions who manage wealth for high net worth uh, Muslims and customers across a number of key markets, including London, uh, Kuala Lumpur, the GCC, and Africa. The responses were hugely insightful. Um, and uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the key findings on the investment side, uh, real estate and infrastructure remains a dominant asset class. And this uh, will drive, uh, you know, is driven primarily by some of the historical decision making. People like to own assets um, and, the, uh, and property fits very well into that. Uh, and respondents were rate, uh, rating it most important for their post, uh, portfolios both today and in 18 months' time. So again, this continues to be a good area. 62% of the respondents said they would always choose a Sharia compliant investment, even if the performance was inferior to an equivalent commercial uh, product. So that's quite an important finding again. 96% of the respondents stated they were either actively taking steps towards succession planning or plan to prepare for it soon, which represents a huge opportunity for advisors, jurisdictions to tap into this wealth transfer process. 76% explored trusts. Um, as an important structure in succession planning, uh, while 30% explored foundations. Again, these are figures that will resonate with professional services, fiduciary services, finance centers, because these are opportunities um, you know, to highlight expertise and experience. And, and the last point, the 10 to, uh, you know, 10 to 50% of their total net worth um, being allocated to philanthropic activities. So obviously, from a Muslim faith perspective, you have this religious requirement of the zakat, which is 2.5%, but this goes beyond that. We're now talking about 10 to 50%. Again, this fits in quite nicely with the uh, impact conversation, that uh, impact-driven uh, investment decision-making, particularly of the next generation that we discussed uh, earlier. So some final thoughts from me, uh, and you know, the report itself has got many, many findings. We'll send you uh, a link to the report, please do read that. And also uh, uh, a summary of that report that the chamber has drafted, which again is an excellent one. But just some final thoughts from me, uh, you know, in terms of uh, orderly succession, robust governance, and in the integration of next generation, these are the key areas that are driving this demand surge that we're seeing, and it's going to continue for the next 18 months. Um, uh, um, uh, particularly for the high net worth, ultra high net worth bracket. The next generation are tech savvy, impact conscious, and with a global out outlook. This is an important point and will drive some of the supply side product development that's going to come through in this area. Um, the investment decisions around uh, in the backdrop of, of ESG and impact, this is a live point and this takes Sharia compliance structuring and products and services into the mainstream. And uh, and you um, being utilized both by uh, uh, investors of the Muslim faith, but also of non-Muslims. 
Um, and as a result, uh, demand for IFCs and all their industry stakeholders um, uh, who have the expertise and experience um, uh, uh, significantly benefiting from this surge in, the, in this space. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing and stop speaking and pass it back to you, Julia. Sorry, I've taken a bit of time to go through that, but I hope that was useful. Absolutely perfect. Thank you very much, Faisal. So um, you, you've really given us a great overview, but I just wondered, can you put a number, a US dollar figure on this global size of the um, Islamic finance market, roughly? So yeah, so I mean, uh, so so there, there's a number of uh, a number of figures that are thrown around. You know, firstly, in terms of growth, actually, when you look at growth, um, uh, the compound annual growth of the industry is around ten percent since 2006, and the growth in the 21 to 22 is projected to be 10 to 12 percent. Um, and in terms of numbers, uh, you know, it's the current assets are $2.2 trillion globally, uh, and they're projected to get to $3.7 trillion by 2024. Again, these will vary depending on what... Uh, of course, so how you classify this, I guess, is an enormous right, difference. Right. And, 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 and also, um, you know, banking is the significant part, and Sukuk would be the significant uh, part in terms of these assets. On the private wealth side, you know, this is an area that needs to be developed. So there'll be quite a bit of work that will need to be done from that uh, sector. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a growing industry. When you compare it to the conventional industry, obviously, it's a smaller part of it. But, you know, it's a significant part. Um, and as it goes into the mainstream, through, uh, through decisions being made on the ESG side, you'll see that number growing even more significantly. Mm. Do you see in future ESG products or ESG investment and Sharia actually converging to some extent and some ESG actually being structured um, to almost always be um, Islamic compliant? You know, Julia, that's, a, that's a, a very good question. I think it's important. I, I have labored on this and I have uh, mentioned that you know the, this perceived alliance or, or uh, this, this perceived alignment, sorry, um, mm -hmm. between the two. But, you know, we, we should clarify that it is very different. Right. It, it is you know, obviously the considerations when investors are making the investment, um, whereas Sharia compliant is a f complete form of financing. Mm -hmm. So the, even though the, the numbers I, I talked about in terms of projections for the Sharia compliant finance industry being 3.7 trillion, it is a fraction of the conventional global uh, financial outputs. Uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of catching up on numbers. So whether the decision, you know, certainly on the Sharia compliance side, it could be that we're heading towards a, a, a decision where we're saying that all Sharia compliant financing should meet ESG standards at a minimum level. And obviously, that's another discussion. What is the minimum requirements? It's different jurisdiction by jurisdiction. But the other way around, I think it's, uh, you know, it would be, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that develops, because obviously, um, certain, you know, so, so conventional banks, for example, will have their own ESG strategy, uh, you know, interest based products, which are prohibited from a Sharia compliant uh, perspective, are very much um, you know, part of the global finance market. It is the global finance market. So they will have their own ESG. But the, the convergence is an important area. And uh, and, and this is where uh, uh, Sharia-compliant financing comes into the mainstream. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting. One thing I would find particularly fascinating in the report, because I love history, is the explanation, which I didn't know, that the concept of trusts actually comes from Islamic finance legal concepts. And I found that amazing. Do you just want to share that with everybody listening briefly who might also have an interest in history like I have? Yes. So you, the, the concept of waqf um, uh, uh, you know, is, is um, quite an important concept that you know, goes and is utilized uh, to this day uh, across the globe uh, by uh, Muslim families and Muslim individuals. This is a, an endowment that is made for the benefit of the larger community. So this was encouraged uh, during the Prophet's time. Uh, he encouraged people to use 
uh, you know, this structure um, so that their wealth benefited uh, um, individuals beyond just uh, themselves um, and bring that community spirit in. And this concept obviously grew um, during the times of the Crusades uh, when the individuals joined that effort. Uh, they left their families behind and they left their families um, uh, 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 money to try and maintain those families. And this is how the English jurisprudence on the trust developed. But it was all uh, hand in hand. There is quite a wider explanation. I don't want to take up the time yeah. uh, from our conversation, but there is an explanation in the report on that, the historical context. But yes, I mean, it's interesting how that convergence now happens even within the ESG sphere. Yes. So you start off with the trust concept, uh, and there is um, definitely some of the jurisprudence has, um, you know, you can trace it back to um, Islamic uh, waqf endowments. And in the same way, in the modern era, uh, you know, we have uh, alignment in the principles of ESG and, and, and some of the Sharia compliant financing, certainly around ethical, the, you know, the ethical element um, yes. uh, of yeah. finance. Yeah, I really find that fascinating. So with your um, with Muslim clients, do you in wealth management, do they have any preference between trusts and foundations or do you, do you notice any preference? Um, again, a, a very good question. I think um, uh, personally, I don't think there's a preference, but, you know, there's this control element. So in a trust, uh, you, you, the family or the patriarch or matriarch would need to give up the legal ownership of the assets within the trust structure to the trustees who become the legal owners of the trust. Um, and having created the wealth, it's, there's always a complicated conversation about trying to explain to someone why he should give up the legal right to that, to trustees. But jurisdictions like Jersey and other IFCs globally with their regulatory framework and their robust regulators. So we have the JSE Financial Services Commission that not only regulates the individual trustees, but the entities that they work for provides comfort. Um, but again, the other factor when uh, high net worth families are considering structures would be the assets they hold and where they are. Uh, so if they're in a jurisdiction uh, that uh, would recognize common law concepts like trust, it makes it easier uh, to have that conversation. And, and, and some jurisdictions, even Muslim majority jurisdictions, don't have concepts like the trust. So you'd have to use a corporate uh, vehicle or a corporate structure to support some of their um, structuring. As you know, Julia, there, 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 there is a wide co uh, combination. But I, what our research found from a global perspective is that Obviously, there's a 70% tilt towards trust. Uh, and foundations are relatively new. As a jurisdiction, Jersey, um, uh, you know, we started our foundation regime just a few years ago. And we've just actually this week uh, hit uh, our 500 mark on foundations. Right. So Interesting. It's very, very new. Very, very new. Even in the Middle East, and you know, I'm based in Dubai, as you know. And in the UAE, they've been driving this. And they've also, you know, hit significant milestones. They have a foundation regime in uh, the ADGM and the DIFC. These are the two finance centers here. And, and people tend to like the foundations because of its corporate resemblance. So basically, you know, they, they, this control questions come back in and the family is able to sit on the council of a foundation and be involved. It's a bit like a board of directors of a corporate, as you know. So it's a bit easier, but it's still a very new concept when you compare it to a trust, mm. you know, trust side, this is something that has been there for decades, generations, yeah. like you you mentioned, you know, in the 1300s, 1200s, it, it, you know, it's, it's been developing since then. So every eventuality, and this is what families like, the certainty of it. So every single eventuality that the patriarch, matriarch, wealth generator can think of has been addressed by a court case, whether in Jersey, whether in the UK, under English law that can answer that question for them. Whereas a foundation is a relatively new concept. In some jurisdictions, it hasn't even been challenged in the courts. Yes. So that sort of, you know, that sort of drives us the, the demand side. Yeah, it's particularly fascinating for me to see the synergy between common law and Islamic finance. That's some, certainly something I learned from that report. Um, you talked about the role of the next generation in this Islamic finance and wealth management. I mean, how what changes do you think they're going to want and what direction are they going to take things in? 
Look, uh, in the two key areas where I think the next generation are going to, well, three, let's say three, three key areas that I would say that they're going to um, uh, uh, sort of cement within this sector is going to be governance and transparency. You know, the next generation are highly educated. Uh, they've been educated in the Western education system. They've seen transparency uh, and governance at work. They've seen that fairness element. They want to be able to pinpoint decision making at every stage so that they can challenge it, they can improve it, and they can make sure it works for all the stakeholders. So you'll see that more and more in the system. Uh, whereas the patriarch and matriarch generation, uh, you know, decision making was concentrated uh, within a very small circle. I think as the next generation get involved, you will see that, that circle being increased. There'll be increased reliance on uh, professional management. We see this in, in family offices, family businesses. They want to hire the best minds to help them make the most money in the most responsible way. So that brings me to my second point for the next generation. They're very conscious investors. You know, they're very aligned to impact. Um, you know, again, uh, it's, it's been driven for different reasons. Uh, uh, we found that the next generation are a lot more conscious of the impact of what they do today on future generation for their children, for their grandchildren. And they want this uh, ethos being built into their way of doing things. And then obviously the third point uh, that uh, uh, next generation will form and uh, will, will sort of drive would be the technology, the use of technology. You know, we see traditional uh, Wealth creators did business in a very traditional way. A lot of them were traders. A lot of them, you know, sat down and sold goods for a profit from physical locations. Yeah. You now have the next generation disrupting that and saying, no, yes. we want to do things differently. We want to use technology. I want an instant answer. I want to be able to in, sit in my chair in uh, in Hong Kong and be able to invest in, uh, you know, bricks and mortar in the US, in the UK. And I want to know, on a second by second, how I'm doing. So this increased use of technology is also going to be driven by the next generation. They are very tech savvy yeah. and they're global citizens. Yes. I mean, I did notice that there's still a preponderance though in real estate and infrastructure preference. And presumably that means physical infrastructure. Whereas FinTech, for example, and some of the tech um, investment doesn't seem as popular at the moment. Would you see that shifting? So again, um, the, the trends that we see is, you know, a lot of the fintech and technology businesses are in the early stage cycle of their existence. Absolutely. We've seen, yeah. we've seen some huge successes, you know, the unicorns of the world, everybody knows, I mean, they've, you know, there have been huge successes that have come out of that. But essentially, a large part of that industry is still in its very early stage. Yeah. Now, the, the investment rounds that they go through it's it's quite interesting, uh, you know, um, a research that I think K KPMG or PwC, I can't remember, one of the big four that have conducted also found that family money was 60% um, likely to be invested in these startups, which is quite an important point. So uh, even though, you know, even though we the, the, the point you make around um, investment decisions largely being driven and we see real estate being the predominant asset class that the investments are going into. Um, the fintech is a growing one. We see it as a growing one, but I think you, you don't see the volumes of it because it's at the early stages of its in, uh, cycle. But, you, you know, we, we expect this to grow. Even within the real estate sector itself, technology will play a huge part. In Absolutely, terms of, you know, green buildings and all of that, I guess. Right. Yeah. So I think that, and the next generation will drive that. Yes, yeah. So how do you think places like Malaysia and Dubai compare with Jersey? I mean, they must have their own strong points. Yeah, no, I mean, so Malaysia is um, regarded as one of the preeminent uh, centers for Islamic finance. Mm. You know, almost 40% of its banking assets now are Sharia compliant. It's a huge, I mean, it's got global standard setting bodies that are headquartered there that are, that drive the conversation for the industry. Um, it is the central bank, Bank Nagara, there is, it's, is, is instrumental in the development of Sharia compliant financing, not, not only within Malaysia and Southeast Asia, but globally. 
mm-hmm. they drive that conversation. You know, we talked, we, we, you know, we've talked a lot about ESG and sustainability. Malaysia itself is becoming a leading player from a Sharia compliant financing wise, you know, in terms of driving that conversation at the global level. So they are an important part. They will always remain an important part of the industry. But, um, you know, the private wealth niche area is, is an interesting one. Uh, and some of these jurisdictions, I, I, I already mentioned that some of these jurisdictions, including in Southeast Asia, majority Muslim or have very large Muslim populations, but they don't have these private wealth concepts within their legal framework and regulatory framework. So trusts, foundations, you know, how do you deal with private wealth? You know, they have robust and good corporate structures. Their banking sectors are very good. You know, they're you know, aligned with the global banking sector, but they don't have a, you know, they don't really have this niche space and it's developing. So, you know, the, for example, conversations like ours today help develop that market and, and help develop that sector also. Dubai, again, uh, you know, is, is, is a huge player in that, in that industry. And they also are trying to drive that, this niche on the private wealth side. So, for example, in Dubai, they introduced a federal uh, trust law just last year, which is an interesting development for that sector. Bahrain has probably the best uh, trust law in the region. Again, um, you know, it's only been uh, int- uh, passed into law and it's only been uh, developed in the last decade or just up over the last decade. So, you know, they're relatively new when you compare it to uh, G- uh, uh, IFCs like Jersey and, uh, you know, uh, centers like London where, you know, these structures have been available for decades and centuries for private wealth. So, in summary, you know, Malaysia, Dubai, and other jurisdictions play a key part in the development of Sharia compliant financing across the globe. But when you look at specialist areas like private wealth, because of the expertise like we have in Jersey, for example, um, you know, uh, we're able to um, sort of, and the legal parity that I talked about in our law that allows us to deal with Sharia compliant products and services and structures in the same way as we would any other. You know, it allows us to uh, the flexibility that we need to be able to provide these services um, for that space. Interesting. And just from my personal point of view, Hong Kong um, comes within your breakout category um, in the report. What does that mean and how well or or not is Hong Kong doing in relation to Islamic finance? You know, Hong Kong, um, uh, in, as you know, in 2007, took great strides. Um, you know, they, they uh, uh, introduced legislation to allow sukuks. Yes. Um, and, and, and subsequently in 2014, 15 and 17, they issued sukuk uh, in a total value of $3 uh, $3 billion. So, you know, these are um, uh, important steps that demonstrated um, the legal, regulatory and tracks framework able to support that industry. So it's taken these strides. And since then, um, you know, the global sukuk have been listed uh, uh, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. You've had Islamic funds being developed, Islamic uh, banking windows being operated from there. So I think it's all, you know, uh, Hong Kong is a sophisticated financial center. It's always going to be demand driven. Um, and as the sovereign steps in and, you know, there's an enabling environment um, that they've created from 2007. And as the demand grows, you know, it just makes commercial sense. The more demand there is, the more structures, products and services will be available, uh, uh, you know, f- from that perspective. But presumably that's Asian demand rather than Hong Kong domestic demand. Um, you're the expert on on the Hong Kong market. You know, I'd, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to um, uh, uh, rely on you know, what you see on the on the local market. But certainly, you know, Hong Kong is a global player, right? Yes. So, yeah. um, li- like any um, international finance center, when there is a large corporate or a large family business that is looking to issue or list a sukuk, they will look at all the key markets. You know, in my uh, legal days. You know, when we were advising uh, corporates, sovereign, quasi-sovereigns, or even uh, families, private families are looking to set up uh, or issue a sukuk, uh, you know, they would look at all of the markets and Hong Kong would be right up there from a listing perspective. Um, Of course, the industry is bigger and larger and the demand is larger from outside of Hong Kong than it is from within within Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, 
but you know, um, it's, it's always about economics. You know, what is there? What you know can we provide from the supply side that will be taken up on the demand side. So you also talked a bit about the sort of potential of Sukuk and Islamic finance in the corporate and sovereign um, space as an alternative forms of financing. Could you share some more thoughts on that? Yeah, so let's go back to 2019, because I think from 2020, 2021, the numbers are a bit skewed. So mm-hmm. 2019, the global Sukuk market was worth $146 billion. Mm-hmm. Significant number. It's a fraction, fraction of the total bond market. So, for your listeners, obviously, Sukuk is the Sharia compliant equivalent bond. Um, so, so, but so there's a long way to go in terms of uh, making up ground and becoming competitive and 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 an uh, and, and alternative class in itself for institutional investors. However, um, the number in 2019, and this is why I went back to that number, was an increase of almost 19% from the year before. Uh, And a 499% increase, uh, you know, from just a decade ago. So, you know, when you look at that trajectory, the demand globally um, was significant until the crisis hit. Now, in 2020, the industry numbers, you know, we have some industry numbers for 2020, and that and there was a drop from 146 billion in 2019 to 240 billion, uh, and so you know that shows you that the demand came down. But the forecast for 2021 was again a 10 percent increase. So the Sukuk market is uh, you know is a huge market. It's going to be um, as more and more sovereigns come on board. You know the UK um, uh, issued its second sovereign Sukuk last year. It's a G7 economy doing that. So that adds credibility to that form of uh, alternative finance. You've got all these sovereigns across the world that have um, you know, are now in huge budget deficits as a result of the support that they've had to provide through the crisis. And they will look to uh, you know, other ways of raising this debt or raising this finance. And Sukuk provides a useful alternative. And you, we're seeing African governments, we're seeing Asian governments doing just that, you know, looking at exploring and opening up their legal framework. The issue is going to be uh, the legal framework of these jurisdictions allowing this flexibility, like what Hong Kong did in 2007. Because of the way some of these Sharia-compliant structures work, there needs to be uh, an enabling environment provided by the regulators and the laws of the jurisdiction so that it makes the uh, the uh, issuance of and the uh, structuring of these products viable in these markets. And this is quite a big uh, step that needs to be taken. Either. And then that would encourage corporates and families to also uh, 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 issue Sukuk because a lot of these, in markets where these uh, enabling framework has been provided, you've had corporates and family businesses taking that step in and issuing Sukuk. And this is important for developing that market. Absolutely. So do you think some of that enabling legislation um, and perhaps the lack of it is why some jurisdictions, for example, which have quite large Muslim populations like the Indian subcontinent and parts of um, the non-GCC Middle East um, countries, they don't seem to be significant in terms of Islamic finance? Yes. Uh, The short answer would uh, would be that because I think you will find that even within these jurisdictions, there are pockets of uh, products and services and mutual um, uh, kind of organizations that are set up, uh, clubbed groups of people that come together, uh, and particularly tax, Julia. I think if you look at some of these jurisdictions, the issue is taxation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. you know, I, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you and your views, and I know we're running out of time, but just a minute, if I can just explain one product structure and bring this to life, you know, you have a lot of the uh, Sharia compliant structures are driven by uh, the the sale of a product or underlying economic activity. Now, in the conventional sense, obviously, you borrow money and you charge an interest and governments and regulations and laws acknowledge this uh, premium that is made on the the, on on, uh, money that is lent out. But that is not recognized when it comes to the sale of a product or or, or of an asset, which forms the basis of the Sharia compliant structuring. So when, uh, you know, when a profit is made in a Sharia compliant structuring, it's treated like normal profit. So the taxation for that 
makes the service and the product uh, um, a bit more challenging in these yeah. jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah. Is- I know all bond financing of any description is very tax sensitive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's incredibly interesting. I think we have a few minutes left and actually quite a few questions from people who are listening. So let me just um, jump through some of them. Um, here's one. Um, is there really a difference between Sharia finance and normal finance? Isn't Sukuk just the Arabic for bonds, for example? In particular, how do Jersey's products fulfill the PLS concept, which is core to Islamic finance? So I think uh, a very good point. This is a one-week seminar kind of a question. This but let is me another try webinar, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> let me try. Let me try and summarize this. I mean, I've, I've already touched on this economic activity point. So, yeah. I think to better understand Sharia-compliant financing, um, it, it's useful to look at some of the restrictions. So, I, I yeah. mentioned the restrictions in interest. Yeah. So, this is a complete no-no from a Sharia-compliant financing. So, what happens in Sharia-compliant financing is you have, must have an underlying activity. So whether that's a lease, whether that's a sale of a product, whether that's a partnership, you know, these are the three main areas where you have Sharia financing come through. Now, um, in order to have that, you need to have an asset at the back of it. So without confusing people, you know, you as a consumer, you would walk into a conventional bank to get a mortgage and you will walk into a Sharia compliant bank to get a mortgage and you will walk out of those banks with a mortgage. But the difference is, how is it done? And in a Sharia-compliant bank, you would go in there, the bank may actually buy the property jointly with you. It may buy the property and lease it back to you with a plan for you to buy it over the duration of the period. Or uh, alternatively, it may buy it and resell it to you at a higher price, and you can pay that deferred payment over several years. Whereas if you walk into a conventional bank, you go in there and they will borrow you the money to buy the property, and you will pay them an interest on top of the money that you've borrowed, um, which is a, 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 a difference. But I hope I've sort of summarized well, that. Yeah, that's really clear to me. I mean, it's simply putting everything into the principal aspect of it rather than the interest part of it and the actual cost of the asset, isn't it? Yes. And 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 it's at this point, I should also bring in another factor. So one of the other prohibitions that we have in Sharia compliant financing is certain sectors that are prohibited from from investment. So, for example, gambling. You know, uh, Sharia compliant uh, um, investors would not invest in in gambling companies or products and services. And this takes me back to the the ethical investment point I made earlier for next generation. The next generation, they also look at some of these investment criteria and say, actually, that fits in with what we are looking to do in terms of making a positive impact on the community. So, you know, this alignment takes... uh, this decision making out from a niche area like Sharia into the wider, um, you know, mainstream. I have another question here from Andrew Wells. Do you use normal interbank interest rates to determine rates of return? So there is a, um, uh, you know, I'm not a a banker, um, but there is a reference rate used within you know, the Sharia industry operates within the global finance industry. And there are certain norms and reference points um, and measure, even the measuring of success, it has to be by means of reference to global standards. And some of these global rates um, are used within Sharia compliant products and services. So the reference points uh, are there. They have to be there. There is a fluctuation. But in order to make it Sharia compliant, um, there is a complex uh, mechanism of doing that. But to answer the the question in short, yes, there is a there there will always be a reference point to the rates of return that are earned on the global market. um, You know, because Sharia industry operates within that global market. Right. Yes. And someone else has asked, what exactly do you mean by ESG focused investments? Can you give a few examples? Well, I suppose that's a sort of general question outside of Sharia finance, isn't it? I suppose wind farms? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yes. So, I mean, uh, you know, ESG is uh, a value-based decision-making process that um, uh, increasingly investors are demanding um, and product suppliers are providing. So it's environmental um, and societal. 
uh, and and governance related decision making. So essentially, you are saying how is my product service structure impacting the environment around me? Um, you know, what good is it doing to um, not only from a green perspective but community wide? You know, what's how is it impacting stakeholders beyond just the shareholders uh, of the business? You know, how is my investment Im- impacting that? Uh, you know, from a you know from a societal perspective, for example, uh, some of the products uh, you know you, you you're looking at um, sustainability. How can how can we benefit? So you know, how can the wider uh, group of stakeholders benefit from financing um, and make this uh, offering sustainable? And then obviously the governance uh, aspect is supervision. And um, uh, and uh, how how are this monitored? So how do you make sure that you know if the products and services are what they say on the tip? Um, quite complex. Another webinar for that, but uh, you know it, it it is this value based decision making. Yeah, and it'll be very interesting to see how that perhaps develops in an Islamic finance context. You know whether there will be layers of Islamic finance governance onto some ESG investments. I mean, I think that would be an interesting thing to watch. Um, so, 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 yeah. Uh, just on that point, I know we run out of time, but one of the key requirements, and this is another uh, characteristic of Sharia compliant financing, is that there has to be an independent confirmation of the Sharia compliance element. And again, next generation like that, and that's the governance part that they mm-hmm. align with the ESG, um, uh, uh, more widely uh, used ESG principles. So this uh, additional layer uh, and the point that you make, whether sustainability and the wider ESG framework f- comes into that, would be the, in, the next stage of the development of these standards, I think, globally. Yeah, I think that would be terribly interesting. Can I just ask, is Jersey Finance planning to do sort of repeats of this exercise or, or is it a one-off? No, no, I mean, I, the, the idea would be to update this research. Um, you know, it's been very well received globally. Uh, you know, we've had thousands of uh, downloads. We've had the opportunity to launch it uh, in several markets, uh, including obviously today um, in the Far East uh, and the Commonwealth uh, itself. Um, and yeah, we, we, we would look to update. We would look to update this research um, and tr- uh, um, try and look at changing attitudes and see whether some of those investment decisions have played through. Uh, you know, uh, in a lot of the research, you would have seen Julia. Uh, uh, is questions uh, around investment decision making in eighteen months' time. So hopefully we want to be there in eighteen months' time and say, okay, where are we now? You know, have, That'd have be some fabulous. That would be great, right? Well, there's a few more questions actually in the chat, but perhaps you, will, I can pass them on, and you can manage to answer one or two of them um, by email, perhaps. And so, just an, a final question from me: What do you see as the likely um, developments over the next couple of years? What would you see as the single most likely thing to be happening, most important? I think we're going to see. Um, uh, when you say development, I'm going to focus on the Sharia compliant wealth. Absolutely, side. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, I mean, in, in that sector, I think the next gen, because the next generation are going to play an increasing part. Um, In that conversation, we're going to see uh, products, services and structures being developed um, much more quickly and um, increasingly using technology uh, and access um, and and the market share of this will grow exponentially as a result because it will be available for all and not necessarily just for those that are within a particular demographic. So I think it's exciting. um, And IFCs and um, stakeholders within uh, international finance centers like professional services, firms like yours, mm-hmm. and other trust fiduciary services see that potential and they develop products all the time and we see that coming through. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to really look forward to the uh, the next report when it comes out. And perhaps you could ask more questions about demand for technology and what people would like in that area. I think that would be pretty interesting. And it may well have moved on a lot by the time you do the next report anyway. Well, thank you so much, Faisal. That brings us to the conclusion of this uh, online event today. Thank you, everybody, so much for being with us. And thanks to our wonderful speaker, Faisal Barna, for taking time out from his hectic schedule when he's just arrived in the UK and deep diving into the realm of Islamic finance with us today. We very much look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.